You're listening to Boobies and Newbies, brought to you by the Frolic Podcast Network. that asks novice romance readers to think outside the dick in a box and brave the unbridled world of erotica. I'm your host, Kelly Reynolds, and today we are wrapping up the month of April with one final sexy science read. If you haven't already heard the news, next month we'll be discussing all things ooey and gooey and chocolatey, and that's because the theme for May's reading is yummy love, because y'all know I look for any excuse to talk about food on this podcast. So naturally, I had to create a whole month dedicated to food and romance. If you want to be the first to hear about what's coming up next, for instance, I've already got the books picked out for the month of June, then please, please, please consider supporting Boobies and Newbies on Patreon. I'll definitely include the link in the show notes as per usual, but with all of our social media accounts, you can always find us at Boobies Podcast across the board and, of course, boobiesandnewbies.com. I did also want to give a quick shout out to some of our newer patrons from the months of March and April. I know I've been slacking at singing your praises, so here you go. Thank you so much to Liz, Soul, Shiloh, DK, and Anne Marie. I really appreciate your support. I'm so happy to have you as part of the Boobies and Newbies fam. I hope to add a lot more family members to our tribe soon. <laughs> Now, today's guest is relationship expert and coach Heidi Bushy. In addition to offering private coaching sessions and hosting the Relationship Ready podcast, Heidi is also an author, and I've been having an absolute blast reading her book, Relationship Ready, How I Stopped Fucking Randos and Started Cupcaking My Soulmate, because if that title does not scream Kelly I don't know what does. <laughs> so please join me in welcoming Heidi. Kelly, thank you so much for sharing your platform with me, for having me on your show. I'm just so excited. I am a new to romance and erotica reading <laughs> novels. Like, oh my gosh, that sentence came out so twisted. I'm new to reading erotica and, no- and romance novels, and I'm so excited to be talking about the one we're going to talk about today. And thank you so, so much for um, taking the time to read the book and um, to promote it on the show. I just feel like I know that people have read it because I know like <laughs> when I sell a book, Amazon tells me that I've done it, but it's like every, but it's like, oh my God, somebody who's busy, who has like a career and a podcast and a this, like you have a busy life and that you've taken the time to have a browse at it and read it is just like, it makes my heart so full. So thank you. Thank you so oh much. Oh my gosh. No, thank you. Because the minute I saw the title of this book, I knew that it was targeting <laughs> me. Um, I mean, It says even on the cover, I I have my copy in my hand and I'm looking at the cover with the quote of relatable AF and I can absolutely (laughs) second that um, that recommendation because I think, well, you know what? I'm not going to talk about, you know, the story behind your book. I want to hear you talk about the story behind your book. So I'd love to just know sort of what inspired this book and in general also what inspired this fabulous title. Oh my gosh. Well, thank you so much. It was definitely risky to put the F word uncensored (laughs) on the title, on the cover. And actually, honestly, riskier than that was to put in the word cupcaking as a verb. I get more questions about what cupcaking is, which I do answer in the book. Then, um, then I have, then I've gotten any concern over having the F word on the title. Cause I really feel like if you can't handle, um, the F word on the, t- on the cover of this book, you will not be able to handle what's inside. <laughs> so it's a really good kind of, uh, it weeds out the people for whom that, cause like I'm not for everyone and that's fine. Um, but yeah, so I ended up, here's what happened for me. Um, I, I had to get sober to do work around, um, love dating relationships, men, mm. not everyone has to do that. But so here I was like about two years sober and I'm just like, you know, I don't have any vices left, right? I don't drink. I don't do any drugs. I show up to work when I'm supposed to. I'm like forwarding my mail when I move apartments. I'm like, oh my God, this above board lifestyle. My last, my last two vices really were like parking illegally and fucking randos. <laughs> <laughs> and so I was like, 
like, you know, I've seen sex in the city. I, I do, I do what I want. I, I'm an empower, you know, I'm empowered in my sexuality. I feel good about this. I'm going to, you know, whatever. And so I, I made an arrangement with a guy where we were just, we were just going to get down. Um, he had a girlfriend at the time. I don't know whether or not she knew about it. Um, it didn't really matter to me because he and I were like, look, no, no dinner, no movies, no nothing. Just like, you know, getting yeah, down this to is it. our arrangement. Exactly. Exactly. And at the, you know, in the moment when I made that agreement with him, I felt good about that. It felt like, yes, I do what I want. It felt great. And, um, and we did that for a couple of months and, and I had a lot of fun. Like I had a lot mm. of fun doing that. Um, and then eventually he broke up with his girlfriend and then maybe like a month after that, he came to me and was like, Hey, you know, I actually feel like I'm objectifying you a little bit. Do you think we could go to dinner and get down or go to a movie and get down? And I said to him, like, we could do that, but that would be dating, you know? And he was like, I was, I was clear with you from the beginning. I don't want to date you. And he said that sentence to me. And in that moment, the bottom really fell out for me. Or like, I really came up to looking at myself in a mirror and just realizing that, months prior when I'd made this agreement with him, maybe it was honoring my truth that I, you know, that, and it really did feel good. But in the moment I realized, oh my God, I've been lying to myself for a minute because I've really been hoping that he was going to dump his girlfriend and choose me and date me. And we're going to like, mm. I'm going to run off into the sunset with this gem of a cheating man. Right. So- I mean, that's the story of every <laughs> rom-com of the early 2000s, isn't it? Yes, right. You know, so some of it is because of culture. Some of it is because of rom-coms and the way they affected, uh, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm not like addicted to rom-coms, but I feel like, you know, I was born in the eighties. I watched my fair amount of Meg Ryan and Tom Hanks and Julia Roberts. And- oh, Girl, you know, all me that, too. Right? So it's like, yeah, there is a slice of that that informs how I show up into relationships and how I expect things are going to go. And we can talk more about that later. But um, I, in that moment, I realized like, oh, I am fucked because the only tools, because I think what this actually means is that I'm actually really looking for something like long term. I'm hoping that I will get to date someone meaningful in my life. But the only tools I have are like swiping left and swiping right. And making Mm. these kind of like, you know, no strings attached arrangements that like hookup culture kind of says like, it's, you know, kind of involved in hookup culture where it's like, I'm supposed to be cool. I'm supposed to not care. Like, how does that all square with what I really want? And so, you know, the reality is, and, and I make this really clear in the beginning of the book, like if you are fucking randos and having a good time doing it, keep doing it. But what happened for me in the moment of having that conversation with that guy was like, oh, this doesn't honor my truth anymore. Right. And now I don't have any tools to find something that does. And so I, um, you know, long story short is I had a friend who'd done some of this work and she offered to take me through it and I agreed to do it. And it took me an entire year. It doesn't take everyone that long. I'm like particularly stubborn and, um, (laughs) and like oppositionally defiant. It just took me a long time to get through it. Um, and then after that, it took me, um, about a year of kind of failing faster in the dating world, you know, um, you know, kind of weeding guys out more quickly, you know, recognizing red flags faster, you know, kind of stopping. Cause like for a long time in my life, I have turned red flags into green flags, you know? So kind of learning these (laughs) new behaviors. I can color that. I can paint that green. (laughs) Exactly. It's like paint by numbers over here. Paint everything you see red, green, you know? And it's like, okay. Um, And then eventually I found the man who became my husband. And so basically that was um, all the way back in, I would say 2013. And then in 2018, I realized like, wow, my life is different because the work that I did to find my husband and it actually kind of has infiltrated other areas of my life. And there are women out there that might need to know how to do this. And so, um, I decided to leave my day job. I was a crime analyst with the city of Portland, which was like, sounds like, Oh my God. (laughs) Wow. I mean, it sounds like blue lights and epithelials and, uh, like collection, like very CSI, but the reality is it was a lot of Excel spreadsheets. Um, and so I left my job with the city of Portland and decided like, I, I owe it to myself to write this book and, and to see what happens. Um, because I just, and, and really like to honor what has become my why in my business, which Mm. is that like, it was so painful to feel like, here I am. I'm, I'm sober. I'm doing what I'm supposed to do. I'm, I'm have a career. My life is, I've got my life together in all these areas, except for romance, right? Like Mm. what am I doing wrong? It felt so painful to feel like everyone else is getting it right and I'm getting it wrong and I can't figure out why. Um, and so, you know, the why behind the book and the coaching I do is like, I don't ever want any woman who's out there suffering in her relationships or in her pursuit of relationship to feel like she's alone. Cause she's yeah. not, you know? And so I'm willing to put all my shit on blast. The book is like half <laughs> memoir. <laughs> it's half memoir and half how to. And so the first half of it really, I mean, 
you know, once I moved to an entirely different city and state because a man offered to make me eggs for breakfast, speaking of food and I don't know if I call it food and romance, but (laughs) I don't know. That sounds pretty romantic and delicious to me. (laughs) After a drunken night out at four in the morning, we're laying around his bed. He's like, oh, you know, if you lived in Denver, I would make you breakfast. And I, you know, I'm like, don't threaten me with a good time. Two weeks later, I showed up on his doorstep with all my shit in my car. Like, hey, like, hey, you said if I lived in Denver, this would happen. Here we are. Here we are. You know, Um, I love that you could sell t-shirts that are like, I moved to Denver and all I got was breakfast and a husband. (laughs) I mean, that was such a wild experience that that guy had a roommate who was like, oh, you live here now? And I was like, yeah, I do. Oh, my God. God. Um, So, but the point is, like, I, I, with a lot of distance, and a lot of healing work around some of these choices that I made as a young 20 and even 30 something, right? You know, they weren't all decisions I made as a teenager. Um, I really feel like I know that they can help other women who are out there feeling like, oh, I can't believe I'm so stupid that I did this, right? And so, yeah, so I put all my shit on blast and then I ask you to put all your shit on blast and, um, (laughs) and do the work yourself and see how it changes your perspective on, you know, what your part is in, in these relationship kind of, choices you're making and, and what you can maybe change pattern wise. So that is where, you know, the book came from. And, um, I was lucky enough to have a relationship with a recording studio. So I recorded it on audible. You can listen to it on audible. You can, um, read it in paperback or Kindle. And, um, it's just been really, uh, it's been really fun. And it's a, it's a, um, a piece that's just really part of my heart. That's so important to me. So I love that every day I get to get up and talk about it on a podcast or send people copies that need it or, you know, any of that stuff. So it's been great. That's amazing. I feel like I have like 30 follow-up questions, <laughs> but I'm trying to like rifle through my brain through them. But yeah, no, this is fantastic. And I think especially, I'm curious, you know, during the pandemic, mm-hmm. have you found an increase in clients or people reaching out to you regarding yeah. dating and relationship advice? Because that's something that, you know, I was thinking about, you know, speaking specifically as a single woman living alone through the pandemic too, yeah. like I can see where that would be something that a lot of people would want advice about how to navigate the world of dating is already tough enough. And then to do it when we're all trapped at home. (laughs) Oh my God. A thousand percent. Well, I have to say, I mean, I spent 2018 to 2019 writing the book and then I had just self-published the book in October of 2019. And you know, I'm thinking like, okay, great. I'm going to go on, I'm going to create a book tour for myself. I'm going to, I'm going to go speak on stages about this. Like, you know, and I, I I will say that one-on-one coaching and doing that over the phone or over Zoom had been part of the business plan, but I really wasn't thinking about, I just wasn't thinking about it as much as I was thinking about some of these other kind of like fun, these other fun pieces of it. So um, when 2020 happened, I actually, I was in, it was incredible. The amount of business that I, that the way that I built my business virtually, I don't think I would have done otherwise had it not been for 2020. And so I really, people have become, all of us have become so much more comfortable. Like, Oh, let's hop on a zoom call. Oh, let's hop on a FaceTime. Oh, like the, the ability, the, the necessity of connecting virtually, I think has made all of us more comfortable doing it. And so it's actually been a lot easier. I think it's been really incredible to build my business in this way. Hey, let's hop on a Zoom call and see if we're a good fit. And yes, you're yeah. not the only one struggling. And it really gave me an opportunity to look at my business and go, okay, where are services that single women need? What did I need when I was single? And how can we deliver this in now that we're in a pandemic? And so one of the mm-hmm. things you mentioned, I offer one-on-one coaching. It's like the highest priced service that I offer, but I also offer a group coaching container that I call Heidi B's Babes, which is for single women who are tired of trying to navigate the dating scene by themselves, tired of trying to navigate the apps by themselves. And that is a really incredible container because what I offer there is I offer a weekly Zoom call on Monday nights at 6.30 P Pacific called Bitch Sesh, and I'm on for the whole hour. I love that. Me too, because that's what I needed when I was dating. I needed to be, I needed a weekly bitch session with somebody to like, you know, talk about (laughs) these prospects, talk about how hard it was. So Monday night is bitch sesh. I love that. I'm on for the whole hour. People are welcome. Members are welcome to drop in or drop out. You know, one of the things that's challenging about creating um, content and um, programming for people during the pandemic is like everyone does have um, a bit of Zoom fatigue. So it's like, I don't want this to be like right. another like Zoom meeting. They're like, oh my God, I got to go to it. So it's like, cool, drop in. <laughs> let's talk about it. If you got, you know, if you went on a date or you did a FaceTime that went south, like let's talk about it and then hop off if you want to. So we have this weekly call and then um, all my, every member of the um, Heidi B's Babe membership gets a half hour one-on-one session with me every month. 
Um, you get a little welcome gift. I just love gifting. I love gifting so much. Oh my so gosh, I found- me too. <laughs> I feel like 2020 has been the year of the subscription box for me. I just keep finding these boxes and these things I can send. So, you know, you get a little free gift for joining. And then you also get access to, um, I have an online course that you can do for free. Um, and then I also um, have, oh, a, face, a private Facebook group, which we're not really using because it's actually better to be able to connect on Zoom. How inter- Okay. I feel like I'm going to have to join this like Monday night crew <laughs> because this just sounds like so much fun. Well, and it's so interesting that you mentioned that, you know, uh, this, this is giving us a way to connect. And it's so funny that what we're connecting over and bonding over is basically all the things that are like driving us crazy. Yes. You know? Like when it comes to dating or relationships or our families or whatever. I mean, a thousand it's, percent. It, even if it's just getting together to bitch with people, you know that you're getting together to bitch with people. Like yes. there are people there sharing your pain, sharing the same issues. And I don't know. It, it's so funny that we bond over like yeah. our issues. But I, I love that in a time where I think we're all searching for some sort of connection, yes. no matter what it is yeah. like that. This seems like a great way to provide that. Oh my God. It's one of my favorite. It is literally my favorite. It's my favorite offering right now. I just really love it because yeah, you're exactly right. There's this space to kind of bond over the, um, challenge of dating in 2020 and 2021. Yeah. And then there's also, it's very solution oriented too, right? Okay. So let's talk a little bit. Let's Good. validate your pain. Let's talk about how annoying that is. Let's talk about how frustrating it is trying to actually meet someone over zoom to, you know, meet someone over zoom to determine whether or not it's worth the risk to meet them in person. Like, you know, all that <laughs> stuff. Um, but then let's talk about what your game plan is for the next what week. What can we do? Yeah, yeah. So yeah. I love it. I'm so, I'm so thrilled about it. And I just feel like I feel really lucky. I lead a really blessed life. I wake up every day energized and inspired and, and to be creative around the work that I do to help women feel like they're not alone. I mean, that's like the dopest, that's like, that's amazing, you know? <laughs> well, that's fabulous. And I have to say, I'm very curious once we get into our book discussion to kind of hear your take, you know, as a relationship expert and coach, sort of on the tactics our characters <laughs> take in this book, because I know I have some questions, but <laughs> <laughs> we we will get to that for sure. Um, is that something you ever think about, like, while reading books or watching movies, too? Is, do you ever find yourself, like, critiquing Oh, relationships. A thousand percent. And then especially in movies, yeah. I'm like, I have to just remember like, oh my God, you're, this is not real. This isn't real, right? <laughs> this is supposed to be fantasy. It's, you know, whatever. So it's like, oh yeah. And you know, for me, it's like my personal brand of kryptonite was um, unavailable men. And I think that unavailable men really come in. Like, I'm like, I think it's probably most people's relationship kryptonite, to be honest. Um, but oh yeah. It's like if you do the work that's outlined in Relationship Ready, you'll find your very own brand of kryptonite. You'll figure out what how you keep sabotaging yourself. Mine was with men that didn't live close to me. So long distance men was a big thing for me. Um, or mm. men who were not actually single. This includes men who are like, I'm separated. You're not single. If you're if you are separated, you are not single. <laughs> That is not the same thing. Those are not, those are different. Um, and also Two different S's. Yes. And also like, um, and in that same category would be men who were recently divorced, right? Cause every guy or, you know, everyone, not just men, everyone who gets divorced, like really doesn't think it's their fault, you know? Yeah. Well, and that's important too, that you're asking people to like do the work and like recognize in themselves, mm-hmm. like what's going wrong. Even if it's just like you said, it, it's something that they maybe subconsciously are like constantly finding themselves attracted to yes it's it's their kryptonite yes but um because I know that that's something I never think about like I'll admit that is I'm always like oh well you know every guy I go out with just can't hold a conversation when we're having (laughs) coffee and it's like we'll have great texting chemistry and then you get in person it's boring 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 so I'm gonna have to turn that microscope around and like think about myself, but not right now. <laughs> not right now. Not for now. No, that's true. But yeah, so it does become tempting to start to like look at pop culture as it's around us. And I think that's been one of the biggest lessons of um really just growing up is like, oh my God, it's not real, right? This is created to entertain right. us. It's created to pull on our heartstrings. It's created to feed into those archetype stories that we know that we just kind of like internally know so it's like oh yeah I have to remember that when I watch stuff but yeah no and I I loved our characters and one of the things that's really interesting about reading being new to romance novels and reading them I feel really lucky so I have a long-term relationship I have known her for like 15 or 20 years with a woman named Diana Biller 
who is a romance novel author. And she just wrote awesome. The Widow of Rose House. And I think The Brightest Star in Paris is her next one that's coming out. And I interviewed her Ooh. on my own podcast a couple of, like, maybe a month and a half ago. And she said, I asked her, why do you like romance novels? What it is What is it about them? And I really hadn't even read hers yet as I was interviewing her. And she said, I love them because generally they have a storyline of healing. And ever since, you know, hearing her say that, I can see that I've read three romance novels since. And um, I can see that thread in every one. And I really appreciate that. I think it's really cool. Yes. Wait, is this Diana Biller of The Widow of Rose House? Yes. Oh, my gosh. Well, in that book, man, whew, oh. that book, like, was on every top list of uh, 2019, I think. Yes, yes, and 2019. If people have not read it, I will definitely put a link in the show notes because mm-hmm. it is a must read. It is so good. It's so good. And I mean, it's different than it is different than hot fudge and a heartthrob, but it's in some ways it's very yes. similar because there is this kind of healing. I could see the, the storyline of healing. When I look at it through that lens that she kind of offered me, I'm like, Oh, I see that healing here in this book as well. And there are things that, you know, there are some similarities that I really like. Yeah. And a lot of hope, a lot yes. of hope, a lot of love, a lot of healing. I mean, It's, you know, there's two ways to face a romance novel when you sit down to especially read your first one. And it's either A, well, I already know how this is going to end, so what's the (laughs) point? Or it's B, I know how this is going to end, and there's there's a satisfaction and hope within that Mm. knowledge because – now I, I don't have to worry about somebody dying. Yes. I don't have to worry about them breaking up. I don't have to worry about all these things because I know in the end, mm-hmm. this is going to end happily. And now knowing that I can enjoy the journey to get there. Yes. Oh my God. That is so powerful. And I'll tell you, okay, I just had to go on a really long road trip and I was listening to, I've read three romance novels. So I read The Widow of Rose House. And then I read yes. Get a Life, Chloe Brown. And then I read <gasps> Hot Fudge and Heart Hot Fudge and Heart Throb. So those are my three. This is where my my expertise comes from. <laughs> You've had, you know, I have to say, if you're going to like begin your romance reading <laughs> journey with these three books, mm-hmm. that's a pretty awesome way to I start. know. I turned to my <laughs> husband and I'm like, I think I like romance novels. These are fantastic. <laughs> this is so great. Yes. Um, but one of the things I loved about, I listened to um, Get a Life, Chloe Brown on this long drive. I had to drive from Portland to Sacramento and back uh, in the last Oh, week. nice. And um, I was like, I knew, I know it's going to, they get in a pretty serious fight towards the end of that book. And I was like, yes. oh my God, is this going to end? I don't know. And I didn't, I didn't quite know enough <laughs> about the genre to, to be sure that they were going to get back together, but uh, you know, newsflash they do. And, um, but <laughs> I got to kind of look at how they were approaching their fight even and just go, oh wow. They're like really using some good they're fighting fair. They're using some good tools. Yes. Like they're not, I was like, Oh, I could learn something from this, this fight that's in this romance novel, you know? And, um, and so I really thought it was so cool to know that they're going to get back together and to be able to kind of listen to this fight that they're having and go and go, what can I learn from this? How are, you know, not necessarily mm. that it's reality. Right. But I'm like, are there lessons here that I could learn? And I thought that was really powerful. And, Absolutely. Um, and the other thing I like about all three of these books, I was telling my husband is like, I feel like we've been, he and I have been married for almost three years now. So it's been a minute since we courted, although, you know, romance is alive (laughs) and well, but I, um, every, every main character in the book, in in all three of these books reminds me of a piece of him. And so, you know, it's not all fiction, you know, of course my husband doesn't embody these like male lead characters all the time, but they're from every single story. There are things that these characters do that I'm like, Oh my God, my husband does that. Oh, that's so sweet. Or I remember when he used to do things like that. And so it's like, so the reason I bring that up is because as I was reading these or as I've been listening to these books over the past, um, you know, three months or so, uh, I've been like, how realistic is this? If I was a single woman, would I be looking for this? Would I find this if this was what I was looking for? You know, the kind of love mm. that's in these books. And I'm like, oh my God, I'm a married woman. And I have found, you know, a partner who embodies a lot of pieces of these, you know, strong male leads. And nice. so, you know, it's out there, I guess, is what I was, you know, from my own research, I've decided small N is just one one case study. <laughs> <laughs> but No, I, I love that. I love that you brought that up because that's a question, you know, that, I think people pose around romance novels a lot. Mm-hmm. Maybe not so much nowadays, but 
just sort of the idea of like, do romance novels give readers unrealistic expectations right. for right. love and relationships? Mm-hmm. And I would say that in this, I don't know, just really, I got some clarity that like, yes, the romance novel is giving you an, an idealized version or like an ideal version of what this relationship looks like. Right. And I think that's mm-hmm. what I like about get a life Chloe Brown, because they do bring in some reality, some humanity, some like messiness into that. Um, and to some extent this book did as well. There's like some extra baggage that both of the characters yeah. have. Right. So that's, you know, and that's really good. Um, but one of the, at the core of my business, my coaching business, you know, I always tell people like we don't settle. It's out there. You can have what you want. You can have what you want. And in some ways, it's like, you know, I don't think that romance novels give us, um, I don't think they necessarily give us unrealistic expectations. I think they give us some ideals of like, look, this is possible. These things are possible because somebody thought of them, created them, and had probably some real life experience with these things. And like, I I believe that that kind of love is possible for people. And I think that as women, a lot of times, um, I don't know if I should say as women, I shouldn't really blame that on our femininity I think we settle because we get scared um and so then we I agree and then we're holding on to something that's not quite a right fit because we're too scared that like the perfect fit is never going to come and you know what that I think you're right and it's not exclusive to women Mm -mm. too because I know that I have several male friends who around the time they were turning 30 Mm -hmm. or maybe like the first few years of their 30s they really surprised me by saying certain things like oh my gosh like I have to find somebody now Mm -hmm. and basically like make it work if I'm gonna like get married and have kids and do all this and you know I mean my response to that is just like what's the what is this like imaginary timeline that you're like seeing that you're you you know being stuck into (laughs) yes I hear the snaps like I just I'm not sure what and and again I'm this is something we've been conditioned for Mm. for you know many years that it's like you have to have accomplished very specific things by very specific milestones. Yes. So, I had worked with a therapist once that called that the linear social script, and I was so glad to have language around ooh, it. So the linear I social love script. That. Yes, this is the this is this the you know cultural construct of like go to go to four year college, get your degree, meet your sweetheart, get yes. you know buy the house, have the kids, you know buy the BMW, blah, travel the world, blah blah blah. And it's like, look, we can reject the linear social script at any stage and time. There's really no reason for us to have to, to, to internalize it. Um, especially as women, like we can have children way in, way past what we used to think was possible. If that's like really your heart's desire. And there are so many, so many ways to have children. So anyway, I mean, I think children becomes like the fear driver for women that, you know, the biological clock's ticking, but we can reject the linear social script and still have everything we desire. And honestly, in a lot of cases, like we have to do that in order to have our heart's desires. Yeah. In, in, uh, because if we don't, we will do, you know, basically yeah. what you're saying, which is settle. Yeah. So yeah. Oh man, yeah. this got, this got real, <laughs> real quick, but, but I love, I love seeing things like this reflected In the romance Mm. that I do read. Like, I love reading about people who I'm like, oh, yeah, I I know that person. Or, Mm -hmm. oh, this is such a great representation of this person. And so I think that's, uh, you know, for any newbies out there listening to the podcast or thinking about what book to pick up next, Mm -hmm. I think Talia Hibbert's Brown series, Brown Sisters series, Mm -hmm. is a great place to start. Heidi, I hope you read the rest of the book. Oh, my God. I didn't even know there were. I didn't know there were more. Oh, my gosh. Of course there are because there's the sisters. Yes. They and the third one just came out, um, I want to say, in March. So they're all out now. You can go yeah. listen to your heart's content. <laughs> I will be binging them. Loved that. Loved that oh, one. It was so good. I'm so excited. Yes, it's well, awesome. Heidi, where can everybody find and follow you and the podcast and yes. sign up for bitch sessions on Monday yes. nights? <laughs> yes. So you can find me. I spend most of my time on Instagram. It's my primary social platform, and I'm at Heidi B Coaching on Instagram. Um, but you can also check out my website, HeidiBCoaching.com. That has, um, you know, my website has links to all of the um, services that I offer. It has links to the book. It has all of it's there. Those are the two big places to find them. If you have any questions, you can email me as well. I'm Heidi at HeidiBCoaching.com. So it's I try to keep it as consistent as possible. But yeah, and the other thing that's great about Bitch Sesh, I will or about the membership, which includes Bitch Sesh, is that there's you can cancel any time. So like if you I don't know, I'm like I'm like if you join Bitch Sesh and join the the membership and you like maximize your dating, you get booed up and you don't need it anymore. You just cancel it and it's no big deal. So um, it's really easy. It's it's really easy, kind of like come and go with the flow. It's one of my favorites right now. So definitely check all that stuff out. 
Awesome. Yeah. And we will absolutely give links for your website and social media in the show notes so people can check you out and follow and listen and all the good things. So, all right. I think it's time to talk about today's reading. And we got to shift gears. Yes, ma'am. Today's (laughs) book is Hot Fudge and a Heartthrob by Mm -hmm. Dylan Crush, which, by Mm -hmm. the way, I didn't even initially plan it this way, but this this is, episode is coming out the last day of the month of April, and I think it's the perfect transition from Science is Sexy, our theme for April, to mm. Yummy Love, our theme for May, because we've got a little bit of all of that in this book. Yeah. There's like a, the main guy is like a scientist researcher, and the main gal is like a home chef, like, um, Hot recipe fudge making, hot fudge entrepreneur, <laughs> yes. Yeah, yeah. So this was, um, you know, serendipitous, we'll say, this pick. So Mm -hmm. this contemporary romance was published uh, in February 2020. It's available on Amazon for $3.99 Kindle edition. Mm -hmm. It is also the third book in Dylan's Lovebird Cafe series. So if you do want to read the complete series, there's two Mm -hmm. other books that come before this. However, I will say having started with this book that you can absolutely read it read it as a standalone you don't have to read them in order. oh it's really I I like the characters in this book though are the characters yes. in the say oh I'll have to read the oh my god I'm getting so many I'm gonna have so much to do this week <laughs> yeah so my understanding at least from reading this book and just like little snippets of the uh-huh. others are that um the other two book books focus on let's see one of them is about Cassie's romance and Mm -hmm. uh the other one is about Harmony's romance and I think Harmony is the one that's with the uh brother the heroine's brother yeah from this book so oh that's interesting okay I'm gonna pick those up too thank you Dylan for creating a series so that I can read more (laughs) and like really feel connected to the characters I really like that because honestly the character development in all of the romance novels I've read so far has been so good Yes. Well, and that's the beautiful thing about most romance series is that it's usually this like interconnected world. Like I always compare them to like the Marvel Cinematic Universe where (laughs) it's like everybody gets their own book, but we all coexist in, you know, in this case, in the town of Swallow Springs. (laughs) Yes, it's really cute. It's really cute. I'm so here for it. I love the concept of all the characters existing in the same spot. I will say, I don't know if this is going to be an unpopular opinion, but I feel I am feeling for Dylan Crush having written a book that does center around research around bats during Mm. a global pandemic that started maybe with bats. (laughs) I I was like, Oh, no, but nobody could have seen that coming. No one, no no one could have seen that. coming. I I have to tell you that like crossed my mind as I was reading it too. I was like, Oh, oh shit, like, is this, should I have not chosen? No, I mean, and I'm a, I'm a huge Dylan Crush fan, and um, I'm sure many listeners have heard me mention Dylan during Instagram Lives and on previous podcasts because I'm a, I'm a ambassador for the Book Box Babes, and mm. Dylan is one of the voices behind books, Book Box, Book Box Babes. Wow, that is... Hard to say. That is the tongue twister I need to work on, but... um. <laughs> Yeah, no, I'm with you though. That was something where I was like, "Oh, dope! This guy's a, this guy's a scientist, and he's he's working in like conservation." And then the minute they started talking about bats, I was like, oh, "Was this like this is this is my choice? I made this choice. Like this is on me." <laughs> so, There's just no way. Uh, it's so random. I mean, right in any other year, it, I was just like, "Wow, that is wild." Who would have? I, anyway, so it was good, but it was a great storyline. So I set aside, you know, any kind yes. of bat phobia that I had that was related to COVID-19 and bats. And <laughs> I really, really, I really like the character development of both characters. And I have to tell you, I, like I said, I was alluding to earlier, I'm listening to all of these romance novels on Audible. Um, mm. I don't know why. Uh, I'm just, lately it's like, it's, I'm having the opposite reaction you are. Like, I just don't want to pick up one more book and turn one more mm. page. But yeah. I'm willing to have my little earbuds in and just listen to, you know, whatever it is that I'm streaming. And uh, one of the things I liked a lot about this book was that they had every other chapter was, you know, from his perspective, Theo is the main guy. And oh my God, why am I escaping? Scarlet. Her- 
And Scarlet, right, Theo and Scarlet. So every other chapter is Theo, you know, Theo and then Scarlet and then Theo and Scarlet. And on the Audible version, they had two different narrators. So they had, you know, a guy doing Theo and a gal doing Scarlet, which is the first exposure I'd had to that. And, like, he had a sexy-ass voice. I was like, okay. That's that's what you need (laughs) when listening. I mean, I think that's – I'm not a huge audiobook listener, and I think it's because, Mm -hmm. one, it depends on the voice. And that's Mm -hmm. not to say that there aren't – incredible voice actors out there it's just you know your own personal preferences and well then... I feel like you have an incredible voice have you thought oh about doing God. any <laughs> I was like as we got on this call I'm like I just wrote a note you have a great voice exclamation point because <laughs> I feel like you have a really great I don't know maybe you have like a great studio set up there as well but I feel like you should look into doing some audible reading of romance novels I'm just oh saying. you're so so I will tell you that I did actually recently interview to do voiceover for you- um like erotica like ah, erotic novels yes, yes. <laughs> okay so speaking of that because I really I know we're going to talk more about this but I really feel like heart um hot fudge and a heartthrob was kind of like erotica light yeah it's it's definitely like I mm, I'm trying to think where I would rate this on like the heat scale because like we will mm-hmm. do our our ratings later on but for me this one is it's definitely more than PG-13, mm-hmm. but I don't know if I'd call it like a hard R sort of thing. Yeah. I mean, maybe R, but not X. Because then I was thinking, sorry, <laughs> part of the reason I got down the road of this, of Erotica Light, was when you mentioned that you auditioned to do some voiceover work for Erotica. I'm like, are you listening? Are you using the new this new app, Dipsy, at all? Okay. I, I've i also auditioned for Dipsy before. You did? <laughs> yes! I never heard back from them, but oh, I did, smart. I did submit a, um, an a, uh, audition for them and they do, um, they do, you can submit stories to them too, which yes. I think is really cool. So if anybody out there is like looking for some audio erotica to spice things up yeah, or you want to write a little hot fudge and a heartthrob yes. fanfic, oh, triple I X would, fanfic or something, I would be, a, they would be doing it in the caves <laughs> with the bats. <laughs> no. Like it would happen oh, oh I totally forgot I have to give everyone a brief synopsis of this book oh, so yes, they please. know where all of this bat talk is coming from so <laughs> <laughs> here we go this is a uh, hot fudge and a heartthrob by Dylan Gresh we only have one thing in common we're both excellent liars a little white lie that's what started it how was I to know that a tiny slip of the tongue would result in the adventure of a lifetime I'm already curious about that part because I'm I'm not even really sure what lie they're talking about. But and mm. okay, I think it's because she says, "How does she get him to come to the um, her high school reunion? Does she give him a little lie she about that?" She says she'll take him to tour the, the oh the caves. caves. So oh, I know I the lie know. is that they tell they show up to the high school reunion as if they've been dating oh, long distance for a long time. Okay, that's okay. What, that's so, as if they're like together, but they really just met. Fake dating. Fake dating. dating. Okay, got it. it. (laughs) When (laughs) I was like, what? I I read this book, I promise. I don't remember (laughs) there being like a lie to start. There's definitely lying later on. But um, anyway, when Theo Wilder, sexy name, stops Mm -hmm. in at the Lovebird Cafe looking for an experienced guide to show him around the deserted caves surrounding Swallow Springs, I seize the opportunity to get down and dirty with the heartthrob scientist. Mm-hmm. Rumor has it, <laughs> the rumor has it, there's hidden treasure on our homestead, and I've been itching for a way to claim it. But when Mother Nature fails to cooperate, Theo and I find ourselves short on luck and running out of time. We'll need to come clean with each other if we want to survive. And when we, <laughs> and when we go deep. We might find more than buried treasure. <laughs> oh, it's good. It's good. Oh my gosh. I love a good going deep pun. But um yes. yeah, it's so funny because I feel like most of the drama and relationship baggage that's in the book is mm-hmm. definitely not in that synopsis. <laughs> no, that is that synopsis is a is a little misleading. I mean, it's not misleading. That that I feel like is extreme, but you're right. That synopsis Yes, you're right. I'm going to just say that. Yes, you're right. (laughs) I wanted to ask you, though, because as you were reading the synopsis, it made me think again of the Theo character. And I don't know, Mm -hmm. do you ever envision like what they look like? You know, I do, but I'm not really great at like, um, like I know a lot of bloggers who will post pictures of like their 
you know, their their hypothetical like casting of a book. Okay. And because between the book, between like the way the book was written and the way that it was read on Audible, I was getting very much like a Chris Hemsworth Thor oh. vibe. Like a Chris Hemsworth in glasses. Like a Kind okay, <laughs> and I think my go-to is more of like a Henry Cavill kind oh, of yeah. vibe. Um, uh-huh, I mean, uh-huh. obviously, both tall, super sexy, bulky, sexy men. Mm-hmm. So, mm-hmm. yeah, and but I think I'm that the character, I think that the male lead has uh, the Theo character has to be kind of bulky because he has this. He gets stuck in a cave. Yes. As- <laughs> It's like, it's not a spoiler. It's like the opening scene of the book. He's like, oh, I'm recovering from twisting my ankle, having gotten stuck in a cave. And then he does have some cave trauma that he has to unpack. Yeah, no, Theo to me, I was like really invested in Theo's story. Like, that's not Mm -hmm. to say I didn't enjoy Scarlet's story as well, but I Mm -hmm. found myself drawn to Theo because right away we get this whole storyline about how he comes from this family of scientists and adventurers and his last name is Wilder. And I mean, (laughs) you, you grew up in the eighties, right? And so are you familiar with like romancing the stone and yes, of the yes. and her her name was Joan Wilder in oh, those books and I was that's or a in good the movie connection. I was just like oh my god like anybody who like reads romance and knows romance is going to think Joan Wilder um so <laughs> I just kept picturing um like he was part of Joan Wilder's family but yeah so he he is part of this family of scientists but he has like tried to both embrace that. He's like, oh my God, my family is so smart, but I'm just like this sexy hunk and nobody <laughs> respects me. <laughs> so I'll go play professional Canadian football yeah. and also have like multiple degrees in science. <laughs> It's just really cute because I feel like a lot of times we see this trope with women being like, oh, yes. you know, people think I'm just so – like people think I'm cute and dumb, right? And then they have to go get like all these credentials. Yes. Like, and so it's just kind of funny. I thought it was sweet. I mean I, I, I thought I it was a sweet it. part of the storyline that he was like, oh, you know, I'm just like this sexy football player. My family doesn't respect me. And his whole thing is that he just really wants to discover this – um endangered species of bats so that he can like earn the respect of his dad and I honestly I kind of like I like you were saying I liked it I appreciated it right off the bat it felt good and to me it felt like oh you know it's so funny because I feel like especially being in the love dating relationship space we talk a lot about how open women are on uh, a lot of women are about doing the work oh I'm doing some personal development work I'm looking at myself and then we've started even more recently having these conversations of like okay well where are the men that are doing the work where are the men that are doing this stuff and in some way it kind of feels like Theo is kind of doing some of his stuff he's doing a little bit of his work he's talking he's totally is he's acknowledging some of his um family his family inter his intergenerational family trauma like of feeling like he doesn't fit in of of having gotten stuck in this cave and abandoned by his dad at a young age and there's like there's some stuff that he's working with that I'm like yes Theo work it get through it let's do this right and he's he's kind of processing all that stuff in order to be able to show up as a healing or healed um adult to be able to be available to Scarlett yeah well and I love that when he and Scarlett you know first kind of start dating he, you know, finds out that she she was a teen mom. She's got, mm-hmm. you know, a teenage son at this point. And she was very much, like, bullied by, you know, the in crowd in mm-hmm. high school. And I really, I loved the moment where he kind of has this realization of, like, oh, my God, like, I was part of that crowd in high mm-hmm. school. Like, I... I like to think that if I had gotten a girl pregnant, like I would have stuck by her, but I don't know. Like that was a different time in my life. And so I like, I, it's exactly what you're saying. I feel like it's a lot of role reversal in terms Mm of we're seeing the male character experience things that we usually see female characters experience um, because his, his journey is very, you know, emotional and, you know, Mm -hmm. more internal than I would say, Scarlet's is I mean obviously she's got some internal struggle as well but she's dealing with more uh problems that are going on literally I mean we see her struggling with 
uh, I totally, by the way, called who her baby's daddy was going to be. I was like, there's only one other guy in this town. We've only yeah. met one other man. <laughs> so it has to be him. <laughs> so it does have to be him. Okay. Well, this is interesting. Well, yeah. And it's like, well, no wonder. I don't know. A couple of times that I like that the Scarlet character at least acknowledges like, hey, if anyone would have ever looked closely at my kid and his dad, they'd put two and two together right away. Yes. Right? So, um, so yeah, so that was really good. But I agree with you. Theo is having like a little bit more of an internal struggle or like of an internal he's doing a little bit more of that and she's really just kind of dealing with the day-to-day of like okay what are the consequences of having made a decision um as a teenager about like 15 years ago Yeah. yeah yeah about like keeping the dad's identity a secret and then like the dad doesn't want his identity to be a secret anymore. I would have liked a little bit more of that, but honestly that was all coming together at the end of the book. And I can understand yeah. like trying to wrap it up and get it finished, but I do feel like there was a little bit more nuance that you, that we could do. But then I'm also like, Oh, this is a romance novel. This is not a, like <laughs> a regular novel where we're going to like get all no, into this. Like, but I'm, you know, I'm with you on that one. That's actually like my one complaint about the, about the story overall. Like I really enjoyed this. Like this would be like probably a, four, four and a half star read for me on Goodreads. Mm-hmm. But mm-hmm. I will say the one thing is I feel like there were some loose ends that weren't tied up. And one of them for me was the relationship between Scarlett and her son and Judd. God, yeah. I also, again, with the names, like with the Judd, name. all I can think of is like the bad dude who works on the farm in Oklahoma, the musical. <laughs> but... <laughs> I don't know why. Oh my god! <laughs> I feel like I'm so glad that we connected because I like you love musicals. I love musicals. Did we just become best friends over I romance think novels so. and musicals? We might have. It's possible. Possible. Okay, can we take a little sidebar though? Because I need to know what your what would you say is your all time favorite musical? Ooh, you know, for years I would have said Hairspray, and mm. then. I feel love like it. in recent years, I mm-hmm. fell in love with Heather's the musical. <gasps> I have not seen it. I did. I did love Heather's the movie though, so I feel like yes. that's definitely aligned. I'm a. I'm a. I feel like I'm a classic as far as musical okay. musicals are concerned because I saw Rent when I was 17, and I'll never forget that. That was like, oh my god, I loved seeing Rent, and I love West Side Story as far mm. as old musicals go. Um, but that one doesn't hold up great, but the music, I just can't, I just, I just love it. I have a soft spot in my heart for it. So anyway, okay. Back to the real start. So yes. <laughs> no, that was an excellent, excellent sidebar. <laughs> um, <laughs> well, and then I feel like the other, like, I guess at the end, um, you know, we, we basically find out that the father of her teenage son, who again is mm-hmm. the only other man in town is, um, <laughs> her son's football coach and he happens to also be like the husband of her arch nemesis shall her we rival. say from high yes. school yeah exactly yes. and uh and I was like oh this is gonna this is gonna go bad like I can already see this being an issue and so <laughs> I guess for me I was left um wondering we never really got a clear indication of like what his intentions were because Scarlet's yeah. fear was that Judd, Coach Judd, um, mm-hmm. only wanted to be close to his son, I guess, if you want to call him that, mm-hmm. um, yeah. because his son is a, a high school football star. And, like, he mm-hmm. wants to coach him to basically, like, live out his dreams that he had for being a college football star, a pro football star. And I kept thinking, mm-hmm. like, okay, we're going to resolve this. We're going to set Judd aside mm-hmm. because his intentions don't seem great. And – hello, the man that she's falling in love with, Theo, was also a Canadian football star. Also so I'm a football like, star. She's we, got a type. She, yeah, exactly. I was like, <laughs> this, she, he doesn't need Judd. He's got Theo. And But then at the very end, you know, she mentions that she and Theo are going to, like, go out of town and, mm. oh, I'll let him go. I'll let my son go stay at his dad's. And I was yeah. like, wait. Oh, whoa, wait, whoa, what? whoa, whoa, whoa. Like the whole book she's been like afraid about that. That's like been yes. the big fear. So I agree. I think there there was some more unless Judd and the son are getting their own books, like maybe their books four, five, and six or something. I it doubt nice. it. <laughs> it would have been nice just to get a little clear. I felt I agree. I really en- I'm I'm right there with you. I really enjoyed listening to this. I had a great time. I thought the voice actors were fantastic. I thought the storyline was compelling, you know, enough, it was compelling. I wanted to know what was going on. It was really fun. It was like, it was such a great 
read. I personally listened to it while I was like walking my dogs or as I was yes. off the food. And like, you know, there were there were some hot and steamy scenes that like kept things really spicy for me that I liked. But I also was like, oh, wait a minute. It was funny because as I was preparing for today, I'm like, wait, did she ever open the hot fudge business? And then I was like, oh yeah. <laughs> I mean, I had to like put some pieces together on that. So it just felt a little rushed in the end. But I will also yeah. say- it might have been, I might have had the opposite reaction if I would have gotten all the details I'm asking for. I might have been like, okay, wrap it That's up. That's true. Like, you know, whatever. So I can't really say, but I agree. I, I would put this at like a four and a four or four and a half because I really enjoyed the kind of the lightheartedness of it and the easy breeziness of it. And like you said, there's like not that much stress or anxiety because I'm like, right. oh, they're, she and Theo are going to work out. It's going to be great. You know, whatever. Yeah, but, um, everything's going to be good. We just need to know if they like... <laughs> find the treasure and they save the bats and like yeah. everybody is okay but yeah no I'm with you I think the only other thing um it was interesting I felt like that was Scarlet's storyline that wasn't like tied up with a bow and then for mm-hmm. me the other one was that I kind of wanted more resolution between Theo and his dad um at the end oh, like yeah I I think the last we see of his dad is them I mean they have a phone conversation about how they're gonna put up a bat gate on that's it, right? this that's cave. Them. And I mm-hmm. think that's the last time we hear from him. I kind of just wanted that one moment of like, you done good, son. Yeah. Or, or Theo You're even saying. You're a saying, bat scientist, kid. Yeah. Or Theo even saying like, you know what? He's not going to change. I get it. I need to stop right. like seeking validation. Like oh, I wanted that would be good. something at the yeah. end with them. But um, there's a lot. I mean, what's funny is I think part of the reason there's not a, you know, clean bow ending is because there's so much going on. Like we have yeah. the drama with, um, you know, the baby daddy. We have yeah. her trying to find a date to take to her reunion and it's uh-huh. Theo. And then there's them exploring the caves because he's looking for the rare species mm-hmm. of bats and then mm-hmm. also she's looking for and the treasure. treasure I was like <laughs> wow that was like an added element I did not expect <laughs> yeah no I agree I was like wait a minute is this like a is this like um like national treasure like a, like is this a like treasure hunt like is this a treasure hunt storyline or is yeah. this a romance storyline so yeah I agree it's so funny because I understand adding some additional layers to it to make the to enhance the complexity of the storyline and to keep everyone interested but you're right this was and there's like the hot fudge entrepreneur storyline oh so yeah a that's lot. right and then there's like the the <laughs> best friend the best friend's dating the best friend has been unlucky in love and then suddenly is like oh I'm getting married and we're moving in we're moving in together or we've already moved in together you know yeah. so it's like there were just there was there was a lot of complexity going on and in some ways I appreciated it because the because of the variety but you're right it left a little bit to be desired at the end where it was like oh but how did everything pan out so but yeah, yeah. no I I liked I liked all the um I liked all the storylines that were going on. I did like that everybody had a storyline because mm-hmm. I the nothing drives me crazier in romance or anything really where there's just like the side characters that are only there to support the main mm-hmm. character's goals. Like I want right. them to be people too. And so yes. I will say all of the characters in this book have like their own stories and their own yeah. goals and yeah. I I really appreciated that. So that was something I really did like about this book. Yeah. And, you know, another thing that I really liked was, and I think this is um, in service to all the additional storylines and the stuff going on, that by the time that Theo and Scarlett got down, I was like, they better be getting down. I mean, I was like, <laughs> I had been, I was waiting, I was begging for it to use romance novel language, right? Like, I'm like, give it to me, please. I am ready for these two to do it, you know? Y'all better fuck tonight or I'm going to be upset. <laughs> I'm like, I'm not listening to one more chapter without something going down. You know, no, I was ready for it when it came. So I feel like the author, Dylan, did a great job of like giving us just enough to like keep us going. Yeah. They have this cute little scene after they go to the, um, the, high school reunion they come back to scarlet's house this is the first time that he tastes her hot fudge which is adorable literally by the way this is not a euphemism like oh yeah (laughs) actually giving him hot fudge like an ice cream sundae or something yeah (laughs) and she's you know and he's like talking about how cute she is in her little cut off denim shorts you know he's doing kind of that one of those really familiar tropes of like oh she's most beautiful when she doesn't even realize it and she's like in her pajamas or whatever you know and um and i'm like okay they're gonna this is you know and it it but I think I still had to wait like another chapter. But when they finally got down in her house, that it was for good. me was like, 
yeah, that's good. They like do it in the shower. They do it on the bat on the bed. They're in the hallways. Like he and goes the writing down on her. Mm-hmm. Yes, and the writing around it I thought was really good too. It wasn't like off putting. I think that's one of the things as a new reader of romance, um, or. I feel like as a reader of erotica, which I have read a lot of, actually, it's interesting because um, I've read a fair amount of erotica in my time, but I have not read much romance. Okay. So I feel like in erotica, I expect it. Yeah. Like, I know that we're going to be talking about body parts and, (laughs) like, liquids and how they feel and all that. Because that is the contract Um, you're signing when you sign up to read erotica. (laughs) That is what you're being promised. Yeah. Yeah. So you're expecting to hear how it feels to plunge deep or whatever. Right. right. So that's fine. Um, and then in romance novels, I think sometimes the long setup can have you forget that you've signed the contract to get a little <laughs> spicy. And then you get there and, you you know, you're like, although like, oh, I'm shocked. Like all of a sudden, but <laughs> suddenly I'm a 90 year old grandma who's like, oh, my God, he described it as her clit as it was throbbing and swollen. I'm like, ah. You know, um, so sometimes it can be a little shocking when I'm when I'm not expecting it. But I really appreciated the writing. I thought it was fantastic. And it was hot. It was sexy. Yeah, I have to say I was a huge fan of the sex scenes in this book. And Uh they're not super explicit. Like, I think they're definitely (laughs) not, you know, again, not a hard R. Like, I think they (laughs) are on the lighter side, but you still get the goods. And Totally. What I loved, like, I, I highlighted a couple of them, but, like, the first time they have sex, it's, uh, he goes down on her, but it's, like, up against the wall. It's, like, very mm-hmm. hot in the moment. But then I loved, um, there was, I think it was a different time where he goes down on her and she says, like, wow, you're really good at that. And he's like, well, I promise it's not from lots of practice. Like I haven't, I haven't (laughs) been with that many people. And I was like, wow, this is like the smoothest thing to say. I love this. And he goes on to tell her, um, that he did his research and she's like, okay, like what, like watching porn. And he's like, no, I watched like instructional videos, like on how to give good head and I was just like oh my god this is the nerdiest sexiest thing I've ever heard a man talk about and I am here for it so like I I loved that like they were both super real they both Mm -hmm. you know had their flaws but like they were both super nerdy at heart and that was like a great Mm -hmm. way for them to connect Mm -hmm. oh and then the other sex scene was um (laughs) Let me, t- I, this spoke to me so hard. She, uh, she tries to put her leg like up over his shoulder, <laughs> yeah. which yeah. this is something we see in romance a lot where they're just like, I swung my legs over his shoulders yeah, and like yeah. now they're above my head. And I'm just like, bitch, how are you doing that? Cause some of how us. How much stretching did you have to do before? Did you yeah. use a Theragun before this session? Are you. If not, you're going to you need really one after. Yeah. <laughs> Because this is, I just, that is not how my body works. And so to Mm -hmm. me, I'm just like, and so, but I loved in this scene that she does one leg over him and then um, she's like, oh God, like, and like basically tries to get the other one over him. And I think he even asks her like, are you sure this is going to (laughs) work? And she's like, I don't know. We'll see. But I, I loved that it was like awkward and Mm -hmm. They're still talking because, like, to me, it can be the most awkward sex scene. But as long as, like, everybody's having fun and talking, that's what makes it so sexy. I agree. And actually, hearing you describe that that particular scene reminds me of a scene that they have. They do go exploring one of these caves Mm -hmm. together, right? And they're – and honestly, now that I'm thinking about it, I can't remember if they actually get down or not. But they're having this, like, little picnic in the middle of the cave. And I know they're teasing each other about this – chicken salad sandwich oh yeah (laughs) they're like it's so good which I'm like okay chicken salad is not really like sexy food you know it's like oniony and celery crunchy (laughs) but I'm I'm willing to overlook it it is delicious af so I'm I mean I'm totally here to eat some chicken salad I kind of just wish they were eating something else than seed but they're like having this adorable time and I think it really is um kind of uh it reminds me of what you're talking about which is that they're it, they seem like super human they they seem very human yeah. like they're a little bit awkward they're like kind of trying to make some conversation they're getting going and then like things are heating up but then they both show some trepidation like oh my god I don't want her, I don't want her to think I'm like 
a creepy bat guy. You know, he he's like, <laughs> I don't want her to think I'm like this creepy out of towner bat scientist guy. And you know, they're they both like really come to the surface with some of their fears about like what it's like to, you know, it's been a minute for me since I dated my husband and had that, you know, um, do they like me? Do I like yeah. them? Do I like them too much? Do they like me enough? Is this the right thing? You know? So I just really, I agree with you. There are a couple of great scenes in this book where you got to just see the humanity of what it's like to try to date again, you know, of like what it's like to be like, do you like me? But like, do you like me? Like me? And, and it's, <laughs> it's messy. I mean, we're talking about they meet, she invites him to be her date to her high school reunion, which by the way, is like this, I, why would that, why would anybody want that to be their first date, you know? But oh she's my God, desperate. Yeah. I get it. He yep. lives like three hours away. So his plan is mm-hmm. to basically come see her on the weekends. They basically mm-hmm. dive into a relationship pretty quickly. And he's also mm-hmm. brought into like all the family drama that she's going through on like their second date. So, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's. He's in it to win it. Yeah. Like they are skipping over so many of like the traditional steps and just kind of mm-hmm. like diving in to be there for each other. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. it's, it's both I don't know it's it I feel like it's really real in that way too because we like to think that dating goes like a a specific way like this is yeah you know date one this is what that happens here date two this is what happens here (laughs) and um, it's back to that whole social script and uh but then it doesn't always work out that way and no that's not to say that it's wrong just that Mm -hmm. you know things work out differently than planned and uh they they make it work they do. It's cute. I mean, it's one of the, it's interesting because talking about it now, I'm like, well, you know, like typically when I work with women or I work with clients around dating, love dating relationship stuff, I'm like, you know, one of the things that I have, that I had to do a lot of work on myself was like learning how to be appropriately vulnerable. Right. Mm. Cause I'm somebody that like, I will tell you my whole life story the minute we <laughs> sit down and then walk away and be like, Oh, was that too much? Like, the per- it's like the person's like drinking from a fire hose. I'm like, and then, you know, so it's like, it makes it great. It makes, it's a great personality trait for writing a book where you tell your whole story or for, you know, relating to people in some way. But when I was dating, it could be hard for people. Cause they'd be like, wow, that is a lot of information. Right. right. And so it's kind of, that's kind of what happens here, but because we're, you know, because it's an idealized version of reality and because we're in the romance novel world, it's okay. Like they just They're dive okay in and with they go it. for it. Yeah. You know, right. Yeah, totally. But you're right. There's like a lot of things that come to the surface, like right away. Um, and I think that's probably just in the effort to like move the story along and like get you up to speed on what's shaking. So yeah, no, I agree with that. Well, and it is a nice idea like it is an idealized Mm -hmm. idea of like Mm -hmm. what if this happened and like all the worst things that could happen were happening to you and you had just started dating somebody and instead of them running away from all of that because it's not their it's not their job to stick around like if you've been on two dates but what if they Mm -hmm. did what if they stuck by your side and like were there to help drive your kid to school and you know make you eggs and all this stuff like that's a nice idea. <laughs> it is. It is. And I like it. Yeah. And it's like, that's, that's part of the genre, right? Yeah. Of like the hope and the healing and like the ideal. And so I really, I liked it. I really liked it. I do want to give everyone a brief reading from my sexerpt of choice. And this is yes. when she does try to throw her legs over his shoulder. <laughs> This one spoke to me on so many levels, probably because I just turned 30 and also I threw my back out for the first time (laughs) when I, this past year. And I was just like, oh my God, like this, this is it. I've, I've reached my peak. We're (laughs) done. It's all downhill from here. Oh, that's it. So, um, okay. So here, let's see. I'll start with, um, do, do, do. With my legs clasped around his hips, I pulled him into me, opening up for him. He nudged in, biting his lip. Mm, Love me some lip biting. Bracing himself, his palms on the mattress next to me, he lifted up. I moved one leg, risking a hell of a cramp, and hitched it over his shoulder. His (laughs) eyes crinkled at the... Turn the page. Edges as he waited for me to move the other. Damn, where had the flexibility of my teens gone? I used to be able to do the splits. Now it seems like I might split in two as I hitched the other leg over his shoulder. You sure this is going to work? He asked. 
I'll let you know in a few minutes, okay? I put my arms over my head, bracing myself to not send my own skull into the headboard. (laughs) I love it. (laughs) Yeah. It's really cute and it's really real. I mean, it's like, you know, plus it's, it actually, to me, it's kind of sweet because it's like, aside from, um, it just reminds me of like the kind of sweet and trusting adventureness, like adventuresome spirit of like, well, I've seen this, or I think this is a thing people do. I'm just going to try it, you know, and like, see how it goes. It's really a sweet section. I, I feel bad because I don't have a sex serp prepared because I listened on Audible, That's but okay. that was a, a great scene. Um, I don't feel that bad, I guess. <laughs> No, like, it is okay. all good. Yeah, We've talked okay. about several of the scenes, yeah. so people can go yeah. pick up their own copies and read mm-hmm. it themselves. But yes, it's good. Oh man, Heidi, do you have any other notes before we dive into our uh, our grades that we're going to give this book? I don't. I think we've covered all of it. It was just it's been so fun to rehash it and to relive it a little bit. Yeah, Thank you. I know. Well, and now you have you know two more books to go back and read mm-hmm. in addition to the the Brown Sisters books by um, yep. Talia Hibbert. <laughs> That's right. So much reading to do. Okay. Well, we are going to be grading on a scale of one to 10, 10 being Mm -hmm. the very best that it could possibly be for Mm -hmm. heart, humor, and heat. So let's Mm -hmm. start with heart one to 10. What do you think? I am going to give this a nine. I think this is a really cute little storyline and I feel like there's a lot of heart here. And like we said earlier, I feel like we get a lot of insight into both of their personal journeys. So I think I'm understanding this correctly, and I think I'm going to give it a nine. Okay. I think that's absolutely fair. No, I love that. I, I'm i probably going to go nine as well because I, I love that there was, like, this – there was so much heart not only between, like, the two main characters, but also, like, with their family and their friends mm-hmm. and, you know, her and her son. And mm-hmm. um, I, I still would have liked a little more, um, you know, resolution, a little more heart maybe with – uh with Theo and his dad, I would have loved something mm-hmm. there, but I think what's there is great. So, um, mm-hmm. I'll go nine as well. Um, how about, how about humor? Okay. So I, I, I feel like at first I was here for like the small town, ah, shuck stuff, but then it got kind of, it, it got to me a little bit. I'm giving it an eight on humor. Okay. Yeah. And honestly, I, I'm probably even going to go a little bit lower and not to say that it's not, you know, that's had just no bearing on like how good of a book it is. I just don't think it's mm-hmm. like a super laugh out loud, hilarious story. Um, so yeah, like I think I chuckled a little bit, but yeah. I don't think I like dissolved into giggles. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So, um, I'll probably go closer to like a six, six and a half. Um, not that again, not that I didn't enjoy it. And there are definitely great comedic moments and great like mm-hmm banter between the two characters but it's not what mm-hmm. I would think of as like a laugh out loud rom-com so just yeah <laughs> for our for our listeners and readers to bear in mind <laughs> yep, totally totally and then there's the heat what do we the think heat. okay this is a little tough because right this is rom-com or this is romantic novel not erotica right so it's like okay I gotta adjust my expectations accordingly (laughs) and like I said by the time I got to it I'm like Dylan please just give it to me already (laughs) um so (laughs) and but like you said the scenes were not like x-rated I mean I I referred to the word clit earlier but now that I'm thinking about I'm not even sure that that Dylan used that word in any of these scenes I don't so I I I do remember seeing dick like I do remember seeing dick on the page (laughs) (laughs) um so i i will say that but then just because they're not like super descriptive doesn't mean that they weren't hot and spicy so i um and and then there weren't a ton of them there's like me i i so i'd say there's like three to five sex scenes in here so i think uh, this is really. I tough. know. I hear I, this plus, like internal struggle. Like you're, you have like the tennis match of like part of you is like, well, this is it's really good. It's really hot, but it's also not super explicit. I know, I know, but I'm, <laughs> I'm taking this so seriously. Is what I want you to know. So I'm gonna give it an eight on heat as well. No, I think that's totally fair. Um, I was gonna go like seven and a half, seven and a half or mm-hmm. eight. Um, again because it's not 
super explicit, but there's definitely sex on the page. Um, there's mm-hmm. also like them alluding to sex, you know, off the page. Mm-hmm. Like I, my mm-hmm. personal rule of thumb when it comes to heat is just if there is sex on the page, it's at least a five. Like because there's plenty yes. of romance out there that's closed door romance where we don't see Ooh. anything and we just kind of mm. like you know hear about it the next morning. And there's nothing wrong with that. I like to read that too. But um, yeah, I would say this isn't like my peak heat meter, right. but um, I <laughs> I thought it was very appropriate for the book at hand. Like I thought it, it, Agreed. it fit really well. Like, am I a little upset? Nobody got banged in the cave in the book, but <laughs> yeah, I was, yeah, <laughs> but at, yes, the same, I am. at the same time, you know, they talk about how it was like, you know, kind of wet and cold and she did, True. she did lose her virginity and conceive her son in the cave 16 years That's earlier. True. There's a little bit of, they both <laughs> actually have some trauma around the cave. So yes. maybe it's a good thing that they didn't do it in the cave. Yeah. I can understand why. Okay. Yeah. That's yeah. true. Although that could have, re- <laughs> that could have been like the new memory of, uh, oh, this yes, is the healing. This is going to be the good memory we have of the cave. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. We can't disturb the bats while they're sleeping. That's what we learn no. in this book. Everyone is very respectful of the bats, I must say. Yeah, true. And like, they don't even know that the bats are COVID origin. They're just like very concerned about the bats, which is good. Poor cool. bats. Poor bats. Poor bats. Can you- Bats are going to need a new PR team after this. Absolutely. After this oh. But they should probably just take on the team. Whoever's doing PR for the moon right now is really like killing it. I've heard more about the moon and the super moon and the blue moon and the red moon and the wolf moon. Like <laughs> whoever is doing PR for the moon is really nailing it. So bats should just hire the moon's PR team. And also I would say whoever does PR for pandas is also killing it. Because we think of pandas as like these cute little, these cute little, they're like ferocious bear, bears, right? Yeah. So I'm, I think that whoever's doing that should take care of bats as well. I feel the same way about monkeys. Like I think um, I watched this documentary about monkeys in an anthropology class I took. They are the meanest fuckers in the world. Like they, and yet they like kill each other and like eat each other. And I'm just like, wait, people think these things are cute. Like these are evil animals and adorable. They're mean. Yes. Yes. Their PR team is squashing a lot of stories every day. Probably this, this is like day. taking on like I can see the SNL <laughs> sketch that this is like <laughs> creating. <laughs> truly, truly. So, oh gosh. Anyway. Yeah. This was such a fun book to read. So if you're looking for something to listen to or read as you're like laying in the sun or bopping around the house doing chores, I mean, that was, that's kind of the sweet spot for me with this book. Yeah. And I agree. It's not a super long book. Like I want to say mm-hmm. it's only in the 200 something pages, like anything that's like mm-hmm. three, less than 300 pages to me is like a shorter book. Yeah. So um, I, I think this is one that you could read in the bathtub. This is one yeah. that, you know, like Heidi's saying, you could listen to one morning while doing, you know, chores around the house. So. Which is kind of fun because you're like, you know, dusting or whatever. Yeah. And then all of a sudden you hit one of these sex scenes that you've been waiting for. And you're like, oh, I'm a little, <laughs> oh, I'm a little turned on now that I'm doing this. <laughs> it's like, oh, thank you. Yeah. I'm going to have to go <laughs> scrub the tub. Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, please. I love it. Oh my gosh. Well, Heidi, this was so much fun. I'm so thankful you joined me and I'm so thankful you sent me a copy of your book and I hope everybody picks it up as well as checks out, you know, your podcast, your, your coaching sessions, so much, so many wonderful things to offer. Oh, Kelly, thank you so much for having me. This has been a true delight and pleasure. I'm just, I'm on cloud nine. This is great. Thank you so much. (laughs) A friendship is born. Yes. We just become best friends. We might have. I think so. More. There's plenty more musicals than romance to talk about in our future. <laughs> yes, please. Thanks so much for listening. Boobies and Newbies is part of the Frolic Podcast Network. Find more podcasts you'll love at frolic.media slash podcasts. You can follow Boobies and Newbies on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at Boobies Podcast.